Welcome to the Teaching Tax Flow Podcast, where the goal is to empower and educate you to legally and ethically minimize taxes paid over your lifetime. Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. Today, we're going to jump directly into episode 39. We're going to look at multi-member LLC basics. So before you go ahead and listen to this one, if you haven't had the opportunity to go all the way back to episode two that we posted, I believe was right before Halloween of last year, so 2022, we discussed single member LLCs, which actually was one of our top episodes we've ever had. Um, We constantly get good feedback on that, people asking questions related to that. Um, Great feedback on the show. So now we're going to jump into the multi-members. So again, before you do that, go back and listen to the others. It's a great comparison between the single member and the multi-member. Some similarities, some differences. We'll leave that to you to make that comparison besides listening to the show. But before we do that, let's take a moment Thank our sponsor. This podcast is sponsored by Reps Tracker. Are you a real estate investor who is bogged down with a huge tax burden? Real estate investing can open the door to powerful tax benefits. Reps Tracker can streamline the process of accelerating these tax benefits. To take advantage of a special TTF community discount, go to www.repstracker.com slash affiliate slash teaching tax flow and use the code IFG. You can look in our show notes or email us at hello at teachingtaxflow.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Teaching Tax Flow, the podcast. Super excited about this one, as always. So looking back a bit in some of our earlier episodes, we had a fantastic one that we dove into single member LLCs or just kind of LLCs as a general, a little bit of an intro. Today, we're going to look at multi-members, obviously. So as always, again, Chris Pacuro, if you haven't met Chris, Congratulations. Stay away from him. He's too smart and he'll make you feel dumb. But we'll put him on a little bit of a pedestal. So Chris knows more about any of the stuff than anybody I've ever met. And he's he's probably going to shut me up here in a second. So I'll just keep rambling. And I've known this guy for 25 plus years, 20 plus years, has given me some of the best advice when it comes to formation, business formation, self-employment taxes, etc. But multi-members, honestly, I don't know a ton about So I'm going to learn as much as you guys are in this one specifically. So before we get into it, Chris, how's it going, buddy? It is going great. I'm just going to be quiet and you can keep making me feel good about myself. So thank you. But but then you can't get your bald head out the door, man. Well, I'll have to come down there and, you know, deflate a little bit of a a little bit of air. That way you can actually get home to your to your family. So I think the best starting point with this is, is obviously we've talked a lot about single members. Let's talk about these multi-member LLCs. So what exactly is that? Like what falls within the bucket of a multi-member LLC? Multi-member LLC, sometimes you feel a little confused about that, but all a multi-member LLC is, is a limited liability company with more than one owner. So it's really, it's just as simple as it sounds, right? There's no, I mean, I'm sure there's little exclusions to it, but overall, that's exactly what it is. Nick. You are correct. Many multi-member LLCs are two spouses together. Many of them are just two owners. Some of them have, I mean, we, in our private tax practice, CPA practice, we have clients that have LLCs with a couple hundred members. They're doing real estate syndication or what have you. But any limited liability company with more than one owner, or we would call a member, is a multi-member LLC. And just like just like a single member LLC, that multi member LLC can elect to be taxed as a corporation, either a C corp or an S corp. Those are going to be different episodes when we dive into those basics. But that's all from a you know from an operational standpoint. So these are probably very very common within um, all the people we know that are REI. So in the real estate investor world, right? I'm sure we see a lot of this. So like we always hear about you know collection of individuals. One may be a contractor. One may be a really good real estate agent. One may be the money guy or gal. So really when they come together, they're, obviously they're probably very simple to create, just like a single member. It's very easy to form a multi-member LLC. So is that a good example of one where people come together really to the table in a partnership such as that? Yes. And multi-member LLC by default is going to file a partnership tax return from the federal tax perspective. The multi-member LLC, there's a couple differences between the single and the multi, 
But from an, a legal operational standpoint, and again, we are not lawyers here teaching tax. So we're going to talk about the tax ramifications of these, the multi-member LLCs and give you some basics. But from a legal standpoint, it's just still an LLC. There just happens to be more than one owner. Typically on the state side of things, um, there's not going to be too much difference when you register the LLC, which is different than the income tax filing. On the federal tax perspective, there are a ton of differences when it comes to having a multi-member LLC. Now, I'm going to say one for one caveat out there before we start rolling into some of the basics of a multi-member LLC, or we can call it an MMLLC just to be a little more uh, concise here. There are special rules. These are out on the IRS website for multi-member LLCs that are taxed as a single member LLC. These are rare. But if you have a if you are a married couple, you can treat to you could choose to treat your business entity as a partnership or a disregarded entity. So in other words, you don't have to file a federal partnership return if the business entity is wholly owned by the couple as community property under the laws of a state, foreign country, or possession of the United States. No person other than one or both spouses are owners and the business isn't treated as a corporation. So the bottom line is if you have a married couple that are the only owners of an LLC and that LLC is community property in a community property state, then still listen to this podcast because you're going to want to hear about it. But go listen to the single member LLC podcast and the self-employed basics podcast because you would basic you would be a disregarded entity for federal tax purposes. Now, and without going into too much detail, Chris, what is what is a community property? Just for community sure. property is property that is owned in a community property state. Okay, so not every state obviously falls into this. There are some that are considered that. So if, if I remember right in our conversations, there there was about eight or nine of them. That were that is that correct? Correct, and I'm going to name them because we always have to put California in all of our podcasts. Of course, of course. Base, and, and those that are from California, we love you. Yes, we we absolutely love you, and yes, we love poking fun at you. So but it's all fun. Arizona, California, Idaho, Louisiana, Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, Washington, Wisconsin, and Alaska is an opt-in. If you have a multi-member LLC, sp- both spouses own the LLC in one of those states. You what? you may elect to not be taxed as a partnership for federal tax purposes, which makes your tax reporting much easier. Excellent. From a legal thank standpoint, you for, you're still for, an LLC. Thank you. Thank you for going to that. Sorry to kind of derail us a little bit. Just those were, you know, not too familiar with that. So back to your regular, regularly scheduled program. Regularly <laughs> scheduled pro. Absolutely. We're back. A kick back to the MM LLC. I like that. You know what? You know, unfortunately though, it just started the, I started to get comfortable with multi-member LLC rolling off the tongue, and now we're going to change. We'll just roll with it then. Yeah, let's we'll do it. Either way, we can call it an M- MM, M2, M squared LLC. Y'all know what we mean. So so jump into this a little bit, Chris. So like when somebody asks you, hey, I'm thinking about forming something, obviously now we've discussed we don't really what that looks like. So it's very similar to a single member, obviously, just with multi-members. You know, you file a, a, a partnership form at the end. So What's the next steps? Like, what's your other kind of words of wisdom regarding the M squared LLC? When you start the M squared, what you have to consider is you have to register in the state. You have to have a registered agent. Then you would figure out, then you would obtain a federal identification number. You file a form SS4 that file that could be filed online with the IRS or you have a professional help you. I'd recommend having a professional help you. If you need help, please go to defeatingtaxes.com or private Facebook group. We're happy to give you some resources there. Um, But you'd obtain a federal identification number. When you obtain that federal identification number, the IRS is going to ask you, how many members do you have? Why? Because the IRS wants to know, do we expect that you're going to file a partnership tax return uh, for this entity? By the way, those returns are due March 15th, not April 15th, without a valid extension. And if you file the return late, it's two hundred dollars per member per month late fee. Ooh, that's a good that's a good hint for that. Maybe we'll actually put that in the show notes. Just a reminder. We'll bold it. Well, if you file a multi-member LLC, there are a lot of advantages, but you have to consider that the L at that point you're not disregarded. 
The LLC itself will file a separate tax return. We're going to dive into that in a moment and issue what's called a form K-1 to each member. And that K-1 form lists each member's share of the profit, the loss, and any other tax-related activity for that entity. Could be a credit, could be a special deduction. The cool thing about a multi-member LLC, we call it, it's, a, it's your boutique entity, because we can form it, we can to have different members receive different deductions, different shares of income. All of that's laid out by your operating agreement. The, in my opinion, the most important document in the LLC formation, and all the tax professionals understand that the operating, operating agreement is what dictates how we prepare multi-member LLC tax returns. Now, so really, it's, it would be safe to say that, a, that an M squared LLC is not, if you are a DIY person, that you're going to file your own, your own returns, this likely is not the best one to do yourself, just because there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of planning that could go into this, correct? You are correct. Put in your mind that it's going to cost you a decent amount of change each year for state filing registration, for tax preparation, for legal fees or registered agent fees for this multi-member LLC. That doesn't mean it's not worth it. It's just one of those things that I'll give you an example. Um, Try to think of a sport that I don't really give a soccer. Now I'm, you know, some people are upset. I thought they were going to say like curling or something. So it's all good. Yes. So I, 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 I went to an MLS game here in Nashville. I had a great time. If you would have told me I'm in the second row or put me in the second to last row, it wouldn't have changed the time I had because I was looking at the atmosphere and it wasn't worth it for me to buy second row tickets. But if you're talking about my Tennessee Titans, I'm going to pay more to get as close to the action as I can. The analogy is this. If you're someone that's going to be very, they have this business do a significant amount of income, you have some growth, you have a complicated situation, you have the resources to hire professionals to help you, the multi-member LLC might make sense. The biggest thing I see out there is, is a challenge is when people form these LLCs, multi-member LLCs, they have significant filing requirements and very little income because ultimately the overhead costs of functioning in LLC are the same for someone that's doing $600,000 a year or $6 a year. Makes sense. Makes sense. And that's actually really good advice. Similar to, you know, what I hear a lot in my world and have, it's, you know, Hey, a, a patent is only as good as how much you want to put into it to protect it. You know, not, not the same, but you know, it's, it's not to set it and forget it. There's a lot that goes into it. So a multi-member LLC, what we're going to talk about is from a tax perspective, I mentioned this, your default tax classification is a partnership. You would have to elect to be taxed as anything other than that. So let's just focus on the fact that you now, for tax purposes, federal tax purposes, will file as a partnership. In that partnership, that I mentioned before, files an annual return due March 15th. In that form is called a Form 1065. Now, when we talk about, so let's just jump into, you know, the formation, management, and asset protection. I should have jumped into that first, but those are the, the, the pluses, right? I mean, we're not trying to poo-poo on multi-member LLCs, but we want people to understand the mechanics of the multi-member LLC. The difference that, between that and maybe a sole proprietor. So and really, and really we, talked, we talked a little bit about the formation and the management, but yes, let's Let's kind of break it down for everybody here. So like you was mentioned, you know, obviously asset protection, we'll get into that as well. But yeah, let's jump into this. So if you were walking somebody through the steps, and I know you've you do a lot of a lot of education, a lot of public speaking, a lot of events on this. Let's I'm excited to to hear you go through these. Well, so for a month, yeah, multi-member LLC, we already talked about this, but you file your document formation documents with the state that you're going to operate in, not the the IRS is who you file with to get the federal identification number. But these are the formation documents are filed with the state. As I said, owners are referred to as members and the members have an operating agreement that outlines a management, including ownership percentages, share of profit and loss. This is the really neat thing about the multi-member LLC as opposed to maybe an S corporation or something like that. Like John and I, let's say we form an LLC. 
Um, John's a, a lazy bum, and I'm a, I'm a grinder. And uh, we buy a hot dog stand. <laughs> All right, and we say, we're going to split the profits. Okay, great. But I'm upset because I'm the one working the hot dog stand every day, and John's sitting home watching soccer, which we now we know this is really not a true story. <laughs> hey, R&D taste testing is a real job. Okay. No, that's true. That's let's true. Be, let's be serious. There are a lot of lot goes into that. You know, you got to train the taste buds, right? Because I'm doing all the work, I might get paid a certain amount of money per day as a guaranteed partner payment, or we might say, "Look, Chris, you you own fifty percent. John, you own fifty percent. But Chris, you're going to get eighty percent of the profit and loss. John only gets twenty percent because I'm doing all the work. That has to get spelled out in the operating agreement. We're talking about the the formation of management and asset protection. Um, now, one thing to also consider is when you're contributing to the LLC, let's say John and I had this hot dog stand and John had a hot dog stand because he's such a lazy bum, it failed. Yet he has $5,000 worth of equipment. He might contribute the equipment and I might contribute $500 of cash. And that's okay, but that gets laid out in the operating agreement. So for except for the receipt of cash, contributing property in exchange for membership interest is a tax-free event. So John has that that equipment that he has. It, we say it's worth five thousand um, dollars. He's never depreciated it, and that's a fair market value. He contributes that to the LLC for his membership interest. He doesn't have to pay tax. It, he didn't sell that equipment to the LLC. Now this sounds like a silly example, but what happens when there are real real estate assets involved, right? What happens when there is intellectual property? That's why those operating agreements are very important. The life of the LLC is usually limited to a fixed period of time. You know, these, because if one member passes away or one member leaves, now you don't have a multi-member LLC anymore. And when does this make sense? Well, in my opinion, it's best when owners want liability protection. So asset protection, you're a limited liability company. You want to avoid double taxation. That is a C corporation. So the LLC itself from a federal tax perspective doesn't pay a federal tax. We talked about those K-1s going to the, the owners and members don't want to be liable for the debts of the LLC. So basically everything, everything is a little bit different from a single member except for that asset protection. So really asset protection is kind of a, I wouldn't say a no brainer, but that's really, I mean, it's literally in the, the name, right? LLC. It's, so and with sense. LLCs, you can have, you could have different levels of membership interest as well. Like you could be a limited partner or a general partner. So it gives you, again, it gives you a lot of flexibility. When you think about multi-member LLCs, it's a way to formally be flexible with one or more business partners in your own. And you didn't mention kind of a, a lifespan on that. So we'll call it an expiration period. Is there a reasoning behind that, that that's in place? It's not just an infinite um, formation? Well, yeah, I mean, it's going to, yeah, I mean, eventually it'll it'll end. Okay. Right, because I don't know, know if they said anything. Might pass away, that. or mm -hmm, it, it will end at some point. The the LLC, it could be earlier than you think, but uh, essentially, all you know, all good things have to come to an end. Where a corporation is a little different, where it, it goes into perpetuity. The shit, gotcha. corporation or transfer. Excellent. I tease this a little bit. Let's let's you know, to, so put everyone at ease here as we as we kind of wind things down. Let's talk about taxation, reporting, and fringe benefits for a multi-member LLC. I already mentioned you're avoiding double taxation, so there's no tax paid from a federal perspective on the LLC level. We talked that you know you do have to file a Form 1065 and issue K-1s. We'll put those links. Now, with that Form 1065, you're required to report what's called a balance sheet to the IRS where if you're self-employed, you just slap your income and deductions. You don't have to worry about a balance sheet, meaning what's in the bank at the end of the year, what assets do you have, what's your equity accounts. So the comp, so with the multi-member LLC, double entry bookkeeping is required and that tax return requires a balance sheet. That kind of is wrapped into those expenses that we talked about of having an LLC. Mm -hmm. um, when members come in and come out, you know, it gets pretty complicated with the books and records, especially with mem when members are contributing things that are not uh, cash. So, John, we had that hot dog stand going where it's going well. You've got a buddy that that 
that had two failed hot dog stands, and he contributes to those for now 25% of the business. Those things have to be spelled out in that operating agreement, but it can get very complicated because each member of the LLC has his or own, his or her own equity account. One more thing I want to mention, an entity can be a member of an LLC. So you could have an, a single member LLC that's a member of a multi-member LLC. Hmm. That's interesting. No, that's, that's definitely news to me there. So mm -hmm. it was a pitfall. Big pitfall is, to, as we wrap up taxation, if you're a member of an LLC taxed as a partnership, you should in, never, ever pay yourself in W-2 wages. Okay. That's it. I, we've had to undo that. If you're paid a certain salary, those are called guaranteed partner payments. And typically for general partners, your net income from the LLC is subject to self-employment tax. We know that rental property is not. But the positive is, is that your members typically qualify for that 20% section 199A or qualified business income deduction if it's a functional business. But if the LLC owns real estate, then that really doesn't, typically doesn't play a role. Mm. It's final thing I want to touch on. It's not uncommon. It's not uncommon for an LLC to have multiple types of businesses in it. So let's, so you could have an LLC that owns some rental real estate, but also has some business income involved. You know, let's say you are, you buy a building, you operate a, um, you operate your medical practice from the bottom and you rent out the top uh, to someone that lives there. So live work, right? It's you, the LLC. It's one building. It's one LLC. So you might have some rental income. You might have some operational income. Again, you might form a different LLC just for the medical practice and pay yourself rent. But I'm just making an example. I'm not saying that's a good tax plan. But um, and you did make a good point too a, a moment ago too. So basically, just to reiterate, so real estate income is not um not eligible. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the side, but. You, you do not get tax self-employment tax on any real estate income. That's correct, right? In most cases. No, in most cases. It depends. So if you're a you you know if you're a house flipper, John, if you go flip one house, you and your lovely wife, you will pay capital gain tax on that, but you will not pay self-employment tax. But if you become, if you get in the business of flipping houses, now you're subject to self-employment tax. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. The partnership reports things based on, you know, based on those activities. So, uh, and I lied. The final thing is typically the multi-member LLC must use the same tax year, which is December 31st as its partners where it, so I'm not, you know, to, to put a bow on this, the multi-member LLC is a very, very popular type of entity. There are a lot of advantages to it because it gives us a ton of flexibility the negative of it is simply the cost of administration. And before you jump into forming a multi-member LLC, make sure you talk to a professional tax preparer in your attorney. I know that's a disclaimer we always like to use, but it, tru it truly is important because I've seen firsthand, I I I'm not kidding you, we just had a uh, someone in our Defeating Taxes Facebook group reach out to us. They conducted a teaching tax law urgent care session with us. And we discovered almost $100,000 of potential penalties um, for not filing partnership returns when they should have filed partnership returns back from 2018. We're looking back and really, you know, you mentioned that that's a disclaimer that we always toss in, but it's not, it's not just a disclaimer for liability. We'll use that term in here, but it's also just to making sure, making sure that things are done right and most effectively, because this is a, a lot more complex and, you know, as far as for setup, maintenance, like you mentioned, you know, your books really got to be in order. There's a lot more requirements on it. Um, just a lot more planning. But I mean, it's always nice to have somebody that's in your corner with you and not, you know, you're out of your own island. Teaching tax flow community. If you're not a soccer fan, don't spend the money to get second row seats. That's probably the best best way I could put it. <laughs> it's, it's a good mic drop moment. <laughs> so, and thank you again, Chris, for for diving into this. I mean, I was jotting down some notes here for myself, you know, as much as I like to think I know about this just from being with y'all over the years and doing this there. Obviously, there's a lot of comparisons. There's things to consider. And, you know, I love the 
I love the uh, the quote or whoever was the first one to say it. I guess I'm not sure, but you know, is is the juice really worth the squeeze? And making sure that you're going into this with the full understanding. So if you if you've considered this as an option, or somebody said you you need to go create a multi member LLC, go back listen to this a few times, jot down some of those notes. Any questions, always reach out to us. You know, on on our social media channels there, or in the Defeating Taxes group, or email us you know, at hello at teachingtaxhello.com. We'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have. But until then. We will see you next week as always. Thank you so much for joining us. John Trapolsky from the Teaching Tax Flow team is still here. Can't get rid of me. Again, I like to hang out for a few at the end. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this episode again, just like all those prior. Um, we had hit some great topics here. Pick Chris's brain a little bit. He did a great job of really comparing the single member and the multi-member. But as always, if you have any questions, Feel free to reach out. That's what we here at Teaching Tax Flow are for. That's why we've built the platform. That's why we continually extrapolate information from Chris Picuro's brain and put it out there into the world for all of you to benefit from. So if you have any of those questions that were not answered in this show, again, always feel free to reach out. As always, I'll go through the punch list. DefeatingTaxes.com is a private Facebook group. This is your invite, personal invite. Can't say we didn't invite you to the page. Hopefully we see you there. If you're not there already, feel free to send those questions there. Also, feel free to just send us a Facebook message on the Teaching Tax Flow Facebook page if you prefer, or shoot us an email, hello at teachingtaxflow.com. So until then, as always, everybody, we will see you next week. and you should carefully examine the risk factors and other information contained in the memorandum. The content provided is for educational purposes only. We encourage you to seek personalized investment advice from your financial professional. For all tax and legal advice, please consult your CPA or attorney. Investment advisory services are offered through Cabin Advisors, a registered investment advisor. Securities are offered through Cabin Securities, a registered broker-dealer.